Hi, hello, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I am John Mullins. I'm from Themis, and I'll be your host today. Uh, Thomas Dunlap will be your presenter, and I'll introduce him here in just a few moments. A few things as we get started this morning um, or this afternoon, depending on where you're coming to us from. Um, a copy of the today's slides are, are available in a couple of different places. Uh, one is out on our website, themasinc.com. You can go there not only for today's slides, but, but in a few days or so, um, a recording of today's presentation will also be available to you. And you may notice if you've been out there before that we also have a, a large listing of previous webinars out there for you to kind of browse through as well. So you can also download those slides or any of those, watch any of those presentations also. Um, while you're out there, you, you may also notice just a, a full listing of course outlines that Themis teaches, um, along with a public schedule out there also. So feel free to take a look at that at your convenience there, but you can get today's slides and, and eventually a recording will be out there uh, for you also. All right, we're glad you could join us uh, today. Um, Again, my name is John Mullins and I'm your host today. Um, I have the honor of introducing our presenter, uh, Thomas Dunlap. Uh, a little bit about Tom. Tom has worked in mainframe environments and other environments as well for many decades. Uh, during his career, he's worked as, let's see, an application developer, system programmer, administrator, software developer, uh, various levels of management. Plus he's worked as an independent consultant throughout the years as well. You know, you'll find his proficiencies include CICS, IBM MQ, TCP IP, VTAM, DB2, um, and he's worked with pretty much every component of ZOS. Um, he has programming language skills that include Assembler, COBOL, C, C++, Java, and throughout Tom's career, he's been involved with things like performance management, capacity planning, problem solving, uh, software implementation, implementation, and architecture reviews of large IBM systems environments. So I think you're in good hands today. That's great. Uh, one last thing as we get started here, if you do have any questions for Tom as we go through the webinar today, you'll notice in the uh, dashboard, um, there's a, a little a drop down area for questions there. Make sure you use the questions area for your questions today and not the chat area, the, the questions area will be monitored um, for any of that. And if you do, do have questions that come up maybe after the webinar or we didn't get to your question today, you should be able to see on the screen there, there's an email address for Tom, tomd at themasinc.com. You can certainly send Tom questions and he'll get back to you as soon as possible with any of those. All right, the title of today's webinar is Mainframe Modernization Overview. Great crowd it looks like this morning. So um, with all that said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the webin over, web webinar over to Tom. All right, thank you, John. And uh, one minor little thing also, I may add, um, the presentation PDF is on the webinar, but if you look in your uh, dashboard, you can also see there's a handouts there. I made a couple of minor corrections, okay? And uh, by all means, do send me emails. I will answer them. Um, you know, just don't want to get too overwhelmed with questions um, as we go through, but I will accept questions, no problem. So, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, get to it. All right, so I wanted to give you uh, a bit about this is kind of like a, a whole mismatch of things that help make the mainframe, you know, germane, if you will, to today's environment. I did want to start with a um, couple of brief things about the hardware. Um, the business class machines, single frames, there's Z13, Z14. I know there's a Z15, but the business class hasn't been announced yet. So. Um, can't really tell you anything about it. Um, as you can see uh, in the text, I tell you how big they are. They're not that very big, but there's a rough size in there. Uh, you can see 
processor cores, 2030 speeds, uh, memories, right? Four terabytes versus eight terabytes. That's actual real memory, folks, compared to what you might be used to. Well, let's say like I have a server behind me that runs Linux and it's 96 gigabytes. Could be 256 gig as if I wanted it to be. So we're talking many terabytes. Mainframes could be partitioned up, so we can take the physical hardware and make multiple partitions. Well, 40 is stretch. I mean, for a pardon me, for a business class machine, 40 is a bit of a stretch. But you'll see why in a little bit that that may be true. Um, not going to get into all the details about caching. Level one, level two caching are on the chips themselves, the cores themselves. The threes and fours are actually on the uh, backplane, if you will. Uh, the processor chips. So a lot of cache memory, and that's what helps makes the speed of this thing. So, you know, whatever. All the systems have spare memory, spare processors. You know, if your company orders, uh, let's say a system with um, enabled 10 processors, there's gonna be three or four that are kind of there waiting to be used if one of your processors fails. So, I mean, you know, the, that's part of the idea here. Um, the Z series, I actually tell you in a text, the Z stands for zero downtime. Basically, every piece of hardware is duplexed, uh, two power supplies, battery backups all built in, and so on. And that's kind of what makes the mainframe the mainframe, right? We can just pick a, it can just pick up a new piece of hardware if one of yours fails. Um, the channel subsystem, you know, that's kind of important. Notice the speed, folks, 16 gigabits to get to the disk, if you will, or what we always refer to as a disk farm out there. Separate box, lots of disk space we can attach to our systems. Very, very fast fiber optic connections. Um, another thing that's in the text don't really have on the slide is basically every uh, LCSS, has up to four subchannels. Each subchannel set can support 65,536 devices. Hmm, now you know what a mainframe really means, right? Not that I've seen one that big. I have seen a site, I've worked in a site as a consultant uh, several years ago that had something on the order of about 120,000 devices in their floor space. So they can get quite large. Next slide really is the enterprise class machines. Um, you'll notice that the number of cores, the number of processors has gone way up. Now here you see the new Z15. So the Z13, Z14 were only two frames, right? The new Z15 can now go to four frames. I think that's primarily because there's a bunch of expansion gonna go on. Don't hold me to that, don't know. I haven't got any pre-announcements I can give you. Notice the memories, however. Uh, the new Z15 can go 40 terabytes. So we're getting anything. And of course, the LPARs have gone up. Cache is about the same. Uh, the 15 has a, you know, Z15 has a bit more cache. Same basic principle. There's always spare processors, always spare memory. Um, again, the Z stands for zero downtime, okay? So basically we can, right, pick up, it, it can pick up and continue on. In fact, things can be changed around, okay, um, if you will, and um, we can add hardware to it or whatever without taking it down. That's the whole idea behind the Z series. One last little piece of hardware, um, Linux One systems, and again, Z13, Z14, we have not seen the small, shall we say Z15 yet, um, I'm sure it's coming down the road sometime. But these are kind of like special boxes. They're referred to as Linux ones. They're referred to also as Rockhopper. The thing that makes them different, um, they can be totally populated with what's called integrated facilities for Linux. I will kind of cover that on the next slide a little bit. So in other words, these LPARs, you know, these machines can be LPARed and I can run standard, you know, one of the major standard distributions of Linux in a mainframe LPAR, right? Uh, Red Hat Enterprise, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, Ubuntu, um, 
or Ubuntu, I guess I should say, can all be run in a standard LPAR and actually boot it, if you will, from the disk farm, just like you would from a standalone x86 server. Okay. Could also run an operating system. We'll talk a bit more about this later. Uh, in fact, at the end of the end of the session, I think I just briefly mentioned. But there's something called ZVM, and we do run that on our little system. Um, ZVM can actually virtualize machines. Now, I live in Columbus, Ohio, and there was a company here that got rid of their server farm probably 10 years plus ago. And they had about 5,000 x86 servers. They ended up putting everything under ZVM on a single IBM mainframe. About 6,000 Linux guests running under ZVM. So this is right how we can use this thing, if you will. Okay, so special processors. The IFL integrated facility for Linux essentially can be can boot uh, standardized Linux, right? Under ZVM, I can also run multiple guests, and they take and they can use the IFLs, Integrated Facility for Linuxes, essentially a standard type PC ASCII type processor. Essentially, uh, many years ago, I actually got involved when they first brought them out with the company. We actually were able to IPO or boot Windows in a mainframe L part, not supported by IBM, but it worked because of the IFL. Another specialty engine called the ZIIP, Z-Series Information or Integrated Information Processor, uh, originally designed to support inbound distributed uh, SQL requests. So basically it can run there. Now, the thing is all those processors could be kneecapped. So as a consequence, uh, the, the mainframe normal processors could be kneecapped or in effect detuned, if you will. Um, these can't, they run full bore, you know, however the maximum speeds. So the request for like SQL coming in from distributed platforms, and it doesn't have to be DB2, it could have been Oracle, right? Any relational database, um, we're now running on the zip. And basically those times did not count towards what's called the four hour rolling average. So we got basically some free processing, if you will. Since then, they can also run Java. So the zips can not only just be used, there used to be a thing called a ZAP, Z-A-A-P, it's kind of gone away. We can now run Java on the zips because again, people found out they could not fully utilize zips with just pure SQL. And of course, now we can do native stored procedures. So even native stored procedures running on your mainframe can run on the zip. Takes them off your normal processors. Another optional processor is actually a cryptographic. Now there's a, what's called a coprocessor, and I think you'll see this on a later slide. There's a coprocessor that works with encryption, but there's actually a separate processor you can purchase from IBM that's a cryptographic processor. Um, it's used for the feature you see is the last bullet point here, perva pervasive en uh, encryption features. The Z14, IBM brought this out. I don't know that they've retrofitted back to the Z uh, 13 or not, Z14, Z15s have the pervasive encryption and they use this, uh, what's called the ICSF, Integrated Cryptology System or Server Facility, something like that, too many acronyms folks. Um, and basically it is a separate CPU to do all the encryption and decryptioning and with pervasive encryption, it actually isn't doing encryption in memory. So we can actually encrypt in the memory, if you will, running in the mainframe. Um, you know, uh, the disk file systems that are out there and tape have their own encryptioning built in. This is that. Symmetric multi-threading for the ZIP and IFLs. It's been there for the normal CPs. What that basically allows us to do is have multiple concurrent executing threads uh, processing, if you will, on every core. So that's kind of like double duty for every processor, if you will. Um, hardware decimal floating point function. Doesn't sound like a big deal. Well, mainframes have always had packed decimal, uh, unique totally to the mainframe. The binary numbers have always been um, 
easily transition between, let's say, your Linux, your Windows servers, and the mainframe because they're just uh, little Indian versus big Indian type numbers. Pack decimal was always a problem, especially for the newer Java developers because they had this big decimal class to work with to, shall we say, translate pack decimal numbers into something they can handle. And it was kind of a kludge for them to use. Well, then IBM says, well, wait a minute, we know there's floating point. Everybody supports floating point. It's I, you know, IEEE standard. So why don't we come up with a format um, decimal floating point, or what's referred to as deck float on the system. And that can end up where the other systems could handle it. So now we can have decimal numbers that really don't need to be converted. It makes it a little bit easier for modern applications like Java based applications to work with them. The added flash memory, um, I don't have all the specifications. There's a limit to how many cards and how many things there can be. I think the maximum is like 1.5 terabytes. Um, solid state memory in your mainframe. It's not free, you have to pay for it, but it allows us to basically use it for paging on the mainframe or to do what's called um, extensions for the coupling facilities. And again, we'll talk a bit about those, I think, on a later slide, just briefly. So now we can use these, they're, they're not cheap, they're pretty costly, but I mean, I'm sure the prices will start coming down. But, you know, each machine, the Z14, Z15, you're right, they got higher volumes you can put in there. Plug right in a mainframe can be used to just improve performance. Um, the mainframes, those LPARs are done by what's called PRSM. And basically it provides a concurrent operating system support. So we can run multiple different operating systems. Again, on our little mainframe, I run a ZVM system that basically is really running the other ones, but I run multiple systems. I do uh, ZOS, a couple of different LPARs of those, and we do run coupling facilities, two of them, to run a little sysplex you know, on our little so-called machine. So these are pretty you know, nice features. One of the newer things the Z14 introduced um, secure service container, not quite the same as Docker, but now your mainframe can function in the cloud. Welcome to private IBM cloud, okay? Not so sure I'd wanna make a mainframe part of a public cloud, although it's possible. So the secure service container allows me to run containers. Now, the management of containers from something like Kubernetes, or now I guess IBM's pushing uh, uh, Red Hat's OpenShift since they picked up Red Hat. Uh, the management is done on a Linux server. Have not brought Kubernetes or you know the Red Hat OpenShift to the mainframe except through Linux uh, LPAR. But the mainframe itself can have these containers now that are executing. Essentially, a container is a Linux operating system with whatever application you put into it. And there's a lot of pre-canned application. IBM calls them cloud packs. But there's a lot of other software vendors that create these containers, right? And now we can run them. Kind of a small little thing in reality, but it and turns out for large operations, it's pretty nice. What's called server time protocol or network time protocol. So the Sysplex has been around since, oh, I think it's like 1990, 1991. So it's been many years. Um, but it was a few years later, they introduced this STP, the server time protocol. And what that allowed, a piece of hardware, it allowed all the mainframes participating in the Sysplex to kind of synchronize their clocks. So even though I might have machines in different geographic locations, the clocks were all synchronized. So, you know, we could have a, a uniform time. Now, if I did not have an STP, but I still wanted to set the clocks, the network time protocol, the NTP, could do the same thing. Not quite as accurate as the STP. Well, who's gonna squabble over, you know, I think the STP is something like 24 decimals, you know, below seconds, where the NTP is something like only eight. I'm not so sure that that totally matters. You tell me. Storage architecture networks by the fiber channels. Uh, again, that's our disk farm and our tape if you will. 
a lot of people are getting ready from physical tape going to what's called virtual tape. Okay. So, but our connection to the sandbox, right, is by fiber optics, very, very fast. Okay. Something called Hyperlink Express was short distance connection to the SAN. Uh, much faster fiber optic within a certain distance limitation. Something called hypersockets. L, the LPARs can now do memory memory. Um, did not necessarily have to go through the network. They could do memory memory bridges. Now we have what's called shared memory. So the same memory on the machine can actually be determined to be shared across multiple LPARs. And again, sysplex and a coupling facility. The whole idea behind that is I could have up to 85 physical boxes or LPARs connected into a sysplex, what's called a parallel sysplex. They can be geographically dispersed. You just got to pay for the high speed communications between them. And that may not be cheap, but I could have the sysplex. Now the idea is it's a single image to the world. So basically I'm running multiple copies of my application, my operating system, if you will. And if one system were to fail or power outage happens in a data center, yeah, we got battery backups, we've got you know generators, all that kind of stuff to kick in. But if one machine were to go down, the rest of the Plex is still running, right? And work can be, workload can be routed around the failed system or the failed LPAR until it can come back online and join the suspect. So we, again, that zero downtime thing, we don't go down. Okay. So that's kind of the brief look at the hardware that I wanted to kind of bring up. So let's now look at ZOS itself. So again, some things here, um, I'm trying to, you know, make sure this fits within the hour and uh, hopefully it should. So the other things they've done, we have this thing called communication server, which included not only VTAM, but also a complete implementation of TCP IP. I've worked with VTAM many decades ago, actually, uh, worked for an insurance company. We had four data centers. This is back in the 1970s and everything was totally interconnected. We could do failover from one system to another as all VTAM networked and something on the order of about 80,000 CSS terminals. Right in our in our network, and we could easily switch users to different systems when if one system was to go down. Of course, we didn't have the luxury of like the internal battery backups that today's mainframes can have. So you know, a little bit different. But VTAM proprietary, with the internet and the advent of everybody becoming totally internet junkies, like all of us are, I'm sure. Um, we were able to. IBM has been coerced, if you will, to say, let's get rid of VTAM. They've been trying to sunset it. It's not easy to do because it's been embedded into many different components, but we do have the full complete TCP IP implementation and more and more things are working with that. One of the other things that IBM has had included with the ZOS is Apache's uh, HTTP server. Yes, your mainframe could be a web server. If you want to put it on the edge of the internet, that's fine by me. I'm not so sure that, you know, you, it's pretty safe. Um, I don't know too many mainframes that have been hacked without a little bit of help from inside, if you will, or inside information. But yes, we can run web servers, okay? Not a problem. The reliability, availability, serviceability, uh, you're talking about an operating system that started in 1964, okay? And has been, shall we say, tweaked, enhanced, whatever, ever since. So the base components of the system are as old as 1964, but it always have been enhanced in that. Built in reliability, you know, things just don't fail. Uh, you don't get the same kind of thing like a blue screen of death on the mainframe. It's just built that way. However, because a lot of people went distributed all oh, back in the later in the 1980s, early 1990s. So IBM says, you know, got a lot of people coming off the Unix platform. They picked up the ATT kernel and compiled it under the mainframe architecture, uh, C code, right? It's all C code. Created something called Unix system services. So you have a complete Unix kernel 
in Unix system. So your Unix people, you got people coming to university that know things like you know Linux. They know th commands like awk and grep and ls command, all that kind of stuff. It all works. All works flawlessly in a Unix system service. The only catch, it is mostly EPSIDIC based as opposed to ASCII. Uh, improved file system. So the file system on a Unix or Linux is a hierarchical tree. And it, they can do that from USS services, but IBM, they said, we well, let's give it a better twist. So they create what they call ZFS, right? The Z series file system. Essentially, it looks like a standard Unix tree performs infinitely better than the HFS that's part of Unix, you know, the hierarchical file system. Um, interfaces better with the security system on the mainframe, or I should say security systems, not just RACF, but top secret ACF too. Um, but also is shareable in a sysplex, where a hierarchical file system, right, could not really be shared across multiple machines. Um, this can, not a problem. Hypersockets convergent interface, that's the software side of the uh, hyperlink, hypersockets that I mentioned the hardware, and basically allows memory sharing between the LPARs. So we can now pass, we don't have to do networks. IBM has always been uh, putting Java as part of the mainframe ZOS environment. Right now we get Java version seven, Java version eight. Uh, don't know if we'll ever see nine or whatever because you know Oracle has kind of gotten nasty with Java and wants money, you know, big bucks, I think. But we do have Java seven, Java eight, uh, standardized Java, folks, and it does run. And again, that zip engine can run Java native mode. One of the recent additions, uh, ZOS 2.4, I think actually in 2.3 also, Node.js, server-side JavaScript. And I've been tweaking with that myself lately, you know, trying to pick up all the nuances of it, if you will, and building JavaScript applications right now in mainframe. Whole lot of things have been changed here for the benefit of, as it says, modernization, okay? Cloud enable it with the containers and that. So again, Z2.4, uh, I don't have, our system right now is 2.3. So I have not been able to put up containers on ours. I have a 2.4 system sitting in my, uh, shall we say my sandbox type LPAR uh, that I'm trying to configure and get going and get it involved you know, with our normal uh, Plex. Just haven't had the time at this point. Um, but with 2.4 and Z14, and our, our systems are Z14 based, um, we can do cloud containers, okay? Long ago, with things going distributed, one of the other things IBM decided to do was make more things, shall we say XML documents. A lot of parameters and things today are XML style documents. A lot of standards coming out of the W3C and OASIS are all geared around XML documents. And the reason was, is we have a standard way of representing data with XML. Um, and I don't have to give you a lot of information. I can give you the, you know, the XML schemas that describe the data contents and they can be parsed. It is a standard Xerces parser and API, still is, but once again, because it was built for a Unix type system, the Xerces parser didn't run as well, if you will, on a mainframe. So IBM created something called System XML and optimized it. Now it still uses the Xerces API to get there, but from a parsing point of view, it's infinitely faster than the Xerces parser, yet maintaining the API interface that somebody coming from Unix might know. Enhanced security, right? Not only do we have certificates, but we now have security tokens, support for multi-factor authentication, network level encryptioning, right? Um, so again, buying into all the latest uh, network level or you know W3C OASIS standards for security, right? Not just a simple ID and password anymore.
Okay. Fairly new. Zoe. Um, open source. Done by Linux Foundation. IBM is just a member of it, if you will. It installs into the USS side of the mainframe and basically provides a virtual desktop. Um, this is not a picture from my system. This is actually a snapshot from an IBM presentation. Um, I just needed something to give you an idea of what it looks like. But basically it allows you to have in a browser, if you will, a virtual desktop that runs against the mainframe. Why? Well, primarily because you get people coming out of university today that know things like IDs, like Eclipse, okay? And basically that's what they're used to. So why not give it to them? Let them work on a mainframe. There is a mainframe interface on USS that makes it so they can actually navigate through. And what you see here is actually looking at a JES output, not through TSO, but through a browser, right? or through this virtual desktop environment called Zoe. Okay. So I can give people today what they might have seen in university connected through a mainframe, right? I use a slightly different tool I'll bring up here and I think a slide or two you'll see, okay? You'll notice, however, this does include a standardized 3270 character-based screen, except coming through, you know, once again, the virtual desktop, okay? as opposed to logging straight on. So now, right, I can have the best of both worlds in this virtual desktop. They also build in what's called a command line interface, but a very rich thing, and it's built on top of Node.js. So I can create scripts, very powerful Java scripts that can do many different things, right? As far as deploying software or building software on the mainframe, whatever. And of course I can do all kinds of nice little commands through the command line interface. So um, not totally free, there's support charges, but it's not necessarily gonna break the bank. Even though it's open source, there's still support charges or you can support yourself. Also, as part of Zoe, we can do Docker or Swagger, I should say. So we can do the RESTful type interfaces. Uh, and again, uh, borrowing it from a couple of IBM presentations, again, I just, because I haven't had time to implement all this on my system yet, I will under 2.4, it's already there on 2.4, I just haven't got it totally configured yet. So our people can use it. But basically, you can kind of get the idea, the command line interface, right? We can also do REX support, APIs, desktops, the things that a lot of people know, like Git or Jenkins, right? We can use all the modern development tools and again, Swagger documentation to do the RESTful type APIs. Now, a bit more to come about those, but that's just so we can test and drive things. So. Zoe is, you know, providing an environment connected to the mainframe, what people might be used to coming out of, you know, university. Okay. Um, apologize again, I kind of borrowed the screen from IBM. I was trying to throw this together quickly. Um, I do have this on our system, the 2.3 level called ZOSMF. Again, I'm an old, system programmer, system administrator on mainframe, used to all the Parm Live members and everything else uh, configuring a mainframe. Well, you got a lot of people that are new to the mainframe administration today or system programmers. And of course they got to learn all that, but they got to learn TSO, ISPF and all that kind of stuff. And trying to pass along many decades worth of knowledge about how all the components of ZOS fit together uh, has become Pretty taxing in reality. It takes people a high learning curve. Well, the OSM app has views, it has scripts, it allows me to bring people new to the platform in and say, here, it's task based. So I can say, I want to do a configuration for um, MQ. And 
it would allow me to help maintain MQ, install MQ. It would walk me through a series of panels. You know, you really need to understand all the PARM Live members and things involved, but that's something that can be picked up. I can become productive and it can walk me through. As I'm changing one part of the operating system, it will prompt me and say, oh, you make a change in portion A, you got to change portion B. So that knowledge that I've gained over many decades of working with, you know, this mainframe operating system, now there's a little bit of an aid for newer people that they don't, they may not have all that in-depth knowledge, but this allows them to become more productive quicker, okay? It is kind of a beast. Uh, uh, by the way, it does have an HTTP server built into it. More to come about that in a moment, okay? So it can be used, okay? There is a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, ZOSMF uh, does provide um, basic performance monitors. Again, thank you, IBM, for letting me borrow one of your screens. Um, it does provide performance monitors, kind of built around the RMF information. Nowhere near as powerful as your Megamon or, you know, SysView, MainView, any of those, you know, other performance monitors. But it's built into the ZOSMF as part of the operating system, right? So it gives me some basic information, you know, graphically, if you will. Also included would be the similar type basic performance information or availability information for the Sysplex. So we can see the systems and things. Again, not meant to displace your monitors, products that you already have and used to, but as part of the USMF, you know, we have access to all the different pieces, if you will. Again, more to come about how this is kind of done, but you know, you can kind of see, right? If things are available, not available, and so on. Again, basic, simple stuff. ZOS Connect, one of my favorite things now. All the com major components that run on ZOS, um, things like CICS, DB2, MQ, have all built RESTful interfaces into the products. Uh, again, you know, that representation state, tra uh, state uh, transfer type interfaces to modernize your current applications. Okay. And by the way, you do have to change your source code. Uh, if you're used to doing green screens, you know, character-based screens, all that's gonna go away. Now you're gonna be down to whatever interfaces you have that, you know, in the various products that do uh, RESTful processing. Well, speaking from CICS's point of view, um, COM area, or what's called channels and containers. And a containers can be JSON, right? JavaScript object notation. They could be JSON type documents and CSS now has commands to parse. And again, I think I got that actually on another slide. But ZOS Connect, right? The whole idea behind it was, here is the one way to provide RESTful interfaces to all of the backends you see. CSS, IMS, DB2, MQ batch, right? Whatever. And ZOS Connect, does all like the JSON parsing or XML parsing, things like that, and passes back to the applications in the back end something that they're normally used to in that environment. Again, um, messages in the IMS, right? You know, the IOPCB, the CSS would be like channels or containers or COM area. DB2 would be the PARMS for a stored procedure, right? MQ would be a message in a queue. Right, and of course, batch could be, you know, what's called uh, oh, par simple PARMs. Submit a batch job with simple PARMs, or it could be working with MQ queues. So it hides all the uniqueness of RESTful interfaces and all these other subsystems, and makes it one kind of way, and does all the parsing. So the applications themselves. While I can do the parsing of JSON under CICS or under MQ, um, it's all done for me by ZOS Connect. So now I have that standardized interface, if you will. 
also contains an HTTP server built-in, okay? All right, so at the heart of ZOS Connect and actually ZOS MF is something referred to as WebSphere Application Server, actually known now as the Liberty Profile. WebSphere Application Server goes back to 2000. Uh, it was originally built inside of CICS. So it was called Corva Server, Common Object Request Broker Architecture. With version two, TS version two, they split it out into a separate product, WAS, and it was referred to as the you know, normal base WAS or what was called network distrib uh, distribution, or you know, a bit heavier lift, if you will. And it was a lot for people to deal with, okay? But it became very useful. Now, WAS is a complete Java application server. It's built around running Java applications, Java servlets, Java beans, and enterprise Java beans, okay? Well, Liberty Profile, because a lot of people, you know, just took WAS to be too big of a thing. So IBM created this Liberty Profile, okay? And it's a, I hate to use the word subset, but it's a, you know, kind of a stripped down form of WAS but I can build it back up now. The idea behind it was make it simpler to implement, make it simpler to configure, make it perform better, right? For the 95% of the functions that people need it for. So the standard Liberty profile can run applications, servlets, Java beans, maybe. Depends upon the pieces you include. Uh, it's fairly configurable, fairly easily configurable. It's dynamically configurable. I can change, there's something called server.xml and I can make slight changes to that and it will pick up the new things right away. I do not have to do things like restart. Now, WAS Liberty Profile is also the heart of ZOS MF and or ZOS Connect. So this is where the HTTP server runs. So yes, I can do web pages, HTML. We can do Java server pages, Java server faces. You know, all that can be drive your browser-based application straight out of here, okay? So again, this is what's providing that web presence, right, on your mainframe. And again, I can run all kinds of Java. So now I got my Java programmers productive. WAS allows me to, it has uh, everything built into it so I can interface to uh, ZOS, files, libraries, DB2, IMS, CICS. So I have through, you know, the IBM supplied, you know, components of this, we can access all the current resources, okay? I can do KDBC, I can do IMS databases, access anything in CSS. In fact, I can talk between my Java application and my CSS application very simplistically by what's called a link. Uh, CSS programmers know that you know, there's a link command. They can simply link between programs or, right? I can link between a Java program running under WAS and also run under CSS. By the way, CSS has a complete WAS delivery profile bit into it with version five. And we exercise that quite easily. So it can run, right, inside CSS or it can run it by its own started task. Complete Java environment, application environment right, whatever you want to do, including JMS, all right, Java Messaging Services. Okay, um, again, I only have so long. Some of the other components that are now brought to the table, if you will, uh, ZOS Provisioning Toolkit. I can script, and IBM provides some basic scripts, essentially construction of a complete ZOS operating system. The thought process is if I want uh, uh, if I want to test out a special application capability, you know, I probably don't want to necessarily modify the production operating system per se. And sometimes to modify the test is a, you know, a little bit of a challenge because you got to work with all the developers. However, I can also um, 
with the Zeo Spring Vision Toolkit and, of course, the right kind of hardware, or model hardware, I should say, spin up a ZOS operating system with certain features, allow people to test it out, and what also can be ingrained in there right now are things like CICS, okay, I believe IMS, I think DP2 is just around the corner. I'm not sure the provisioning toolkit will spin up a DB2 region or not, but spin it up, let people use it, test it, and you know, say four days later when they don't need it anymore, take it down, throw it away. Client web enablement toolkit, and it's essentially allowing me to build RESTful type applications, but again, with ZOS Connect, I got a more standardized way. The client enable it was uh, so I could build for like batch programs, okay, um, or WAS. Well, now we're even TSO ISPF and the standard HTTP server. Yeah, you know, we do run the HTTP server, by the way, as a, a ZOS started task. So I could do that, but with ZOS Connect, I can do it all in there. All right, so there are many different ways. We now get interfaces to GitHub, Python, Jenkins, many other DevOps, right? One of the buzzwords of our current environment is dev, you know, DevOps. Go from development to operations. I can do all that. <clears throat> yeah, okay, I as a system programmer get agitated because now my developers are bypassing me. <clears throat> that may be a good thing, right? Um, I had to accept that. If I wanted to build Java applications that ran in CICS, I've always had to do it, let them do their own deployment. Well, with the tools like Zoe or a couple of other things coming up, um, I'll mention here the last part of this, I can now deploy applications straight to the mainframe from my desktop. Okay. The whole idea behind DevOps is let development go straight to operations Again, you're gonna have your own standards. You, a lot of your current standards may change, but I mean, we can go straight in, you know, uh, faster time to market, if you will, or faster time to get applications enabled, and we can do it pieces. Again, the, the concept of what's called microservices or macroservices today, we can build small little pieces and kind of like pull them together. One of the other newer things with the advent of the SSD containers, we now have IBM Open D Data Analytics. Um, by no means a replacement for what was called the uh, IBM DB2 analytic, um, IDAA, analytic accelerator. Too many acronyms, folks. Um, but we have now built into a container, again, 2.4 Z14s, right, to support the SSC containers. Um, we can do open analytics. Uh, it's a very can we say smaller operating type form of analytics that can run as a container, essentially on top of a Linux operating system like IDA did, okay? I'm hitting the major features, folks, trust me. I'm not hitting every little thing. These are the major things that now we can use our mainframe for. Okay, so let me jump in. I only have a few more minutes to go. So let me jump in, get through this. So this is all the subsystems, right? So again, WAS LP can be embedded into CSS region, right? Including offload, and most of the stuff is offloaded to the zip, okay? So all that Java code is running on a zip. I don't wanna say free, you pay for the zip, but you don't, the, the time spent on the zips do not count towards a four hour rolling average. So if you're doing, um, you know, pricing of your software on a mainframe based upon what's called MSU, right, your, your service units, time spent on the zips are not counting towards that cost, if you will. Complete support for MQGMS, WAS, LP. So again, all those people that know JMS from university and don't necessarily know MQ, they can build applications to work with MQ and the, you know, the enterprise level, if you will, strength of MQ. Support for Node.js, again, repeating myself a little bit, plus PHP for scripting. Again, the provisioning toolkit, right, ZOS Connect. CSS can also support now Maven, Urban Code Deployed, and the new uh, security authorization markup language, SAML, and again, another standard. So these are all things that now within CICS we can do. 
right? XML parsing was added, JSON parsing commands. So the standard command level COBOL programs today can also parse XML, parse JSON, right? So ZOS Connect can do it for me if I want to do a RESTful type interface. If I wanted to work with a standard based application, CSS could do it and, and commands. By the way, the commands are fairly simple for you know knowledgeable CSS coders, right? Application developers already know CSS command level. Picking up the XML commands and JSON commands are pretty straightforward. Uh, new to is Kix, I believe, 5.5, maybe 5.4, something called GraphOL API. We've had Kixplex SM, uh, a way of managing CSS resources or maintaining CSS resources through a, a basically a WUI, a, a web user interface. Well, they're, 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 it's shall we say, showing its age, okay, that we need a better way to do it. Well, IBM created something called ZOS Explorer. It started out as Kix Explorer. Um, it's a Eclipse-based tool to manage CSS regions has a lot of limitations, could work with Kick. Well, now we have a new API, this graphic API. And I'm starting to pick up that myself. But essentially now through a browser-based function, I can manage CSS regions, do system management. Again, it can support HTTP web servers inside of CSS, and I can, it can support the standard HTTP services or what's called SOAP. Now we use, we teach, or I even teach what's called web services class, but the SOAP is a heavy lift. So more and more people are opting for straight HTTP or JSON based, right? Or even, you know, WAS type applications, get on that zip. Had a product called, or still have, called CSS Transaction Gateway, kind of middleware. Uh, was an, another way of connecting in to CSS from the web, if you will. So the CSS based program can do some standardized things. Okay, um, moving on, DB2. So DB2, the uh, native SQL stored procedures and the DDF coming in is zip eligible. Again, doesn't charge, come there. Two kind of products, uh, application connectivity for DB2 was enough, one way to do um, JDC coming in, okay? Uh, and again, the inbound request that came in SQL type request could run on the zip. Uh, the accessory suite, right, a bunch of components, right, that basically can enable DB2 app applications for mobile. So now I can use my Android cell phone to come in. Again, just little bits and pieces. Now there's a whole thing called mobile first, I believe it's called complete server client environment to do mobile coming in. But a lot of the other products can bring mobile straight in. RESTful APIs were added, I believe in version 12. I don't know if they were retrofitted back in version 11 or not. Again, connect support, you know, so I can do it through native RESTful interface in DB2, which is its own little quirky way compared to like RESTful interface in CSS and IMS. But I can also all do it through uh, ZOS Connect have a standard way of doing it. Hide a lot of the uniqueness, if you will, by Connect. But again, uh, ZOSMF views for administering DB2. Yes, it has its own admin tool, but we could use ZOSMF to do things. Um, I think that's fairly new and there's some, you know, there's things that they got to add to it, but it also can, you know, do urban code deploy. So I can build story procedures, especially native SQL, Java ones, from something like Data Studio or a standard IDE, you know, bear with me for a minute, and deploy them in, right? And have it go into DB2. Sorry, sysadms and DBAs, took some work away from you. Now, one of the other issues was, you know, again, mainframe being EPSIC, well, long ago, version seven, they allowed Unicode tables. In version eight, the internal guts of DB2 is now Unicode. What's that by me? Data conversion. If I wanna build all my DB2 tables in Unicode, I got no data conversion to worry about between the mainframe and other platforms. Again, deck float, the native SQL store procedures, and of course, remote SQL access. I can have a mainframe based DB2 make a request to a relational database on another platform, pretty much straight away, the standard relational architecture. 
A uh, product I've been working with fairly amount recently, uh, InfoSphere Data Replication, allows me to put in agents, if you will, capture apply agents, and capture changes on one DB2, replicate them to another relational database, could be DB2, could be other ones, depends on you know, relational or not, um, a couple different forms, but also with the enhancement of another product, uh, the one that kind of IBM pushes is called data stage. I can re replicate to other non-relational databases or even vSAM files, right? Or just, you know, BTREF type files running on Linux. So again, as my DB2 is working, it can actually create a copy of a database. It can maintain multiple databases in different geographic locations, all kinds of things, right? And again, that's no change in the application. That's all being picked up by tooling that's plugged in the DB2. So as the application updates the database on this particular mainframe, it's replicated to somewhere else and could be multiple places, right? And maintained automatically. Disaster recovery, whatever you want to use it for. Okay, uh, again, RESTful API was added to MQ. ZOS Connect support, ZOS MF support for configuration. So again, IBM with ZOS MF, right, is trying to make it so new system programmers and administrators can become more productive in maintaining these other products, right? Does have complete JMS, something called advanced message security added. Uh, flowing standardized message security headers, you know, again, digital certificates or tokens um, as part of messages. So that I can essentially have one single point of authentication and pass the certificates, right? Uh, across multiple different platforms, multiple different environments, right? So not a bad thing. Yes, I hate FTP. File transfer is part of it, TCP IP. MQ is not free, but managed file transfer is part of MQ. Does a much better job than FTP. Don't have to worry about restarting when I get 90% done. It automatically picks up where it left off. It deals better with network errors. It can do multiple file transfers. I can schedule them through the agent. I can say, I want to do these five files to this system here. And again, the caveat, I do have to have MQ residing, you know, the server, what's called a queue manager. They have to be residing on all the servers where I'm going to try to transfer files. You got those licenses to worry about, you know, but far better way of transferring files. Various clients, again, I don't know, 80 some different client interfaces. Client interface MQ is the uh, enough to run the programming interface and do basic communications to the server, you know, through like TCP IP. Also a favorite one, I haven't seen a commercial for a while yet. Uh, it's you know, about no, maybe a year ago, I saw it quite a bit. Your refrigerator has cameras. It's internet enabled. How did that happen? MQTT, telemetry, uh, MQ telemetry transport. Hardware EPROMs can be programmed with MQ and basically it can transfer messages. The MQ messages can contain anything. It doesn't have to be text data. It could be images. It can be sound bites. It could be video clips, whatever your little heart desires, okay? So I could, and people, you know, there are hardware devices that can basically send an MQ message, client, if you will, into a server somewhere and say, oh, you got to order milk. You know, welcome to the internet of things. Okay. All right. Ooh, getting close. Got to run a couple of minutes over, folks. I'm sorry um, about that. I've only got a few more slides to go. So tooling added. Uh, again, relational team concert environment running on ZOS. Standardized source code management, document management, all kinds of things. Uh, urban code deploy. Again, so I can allow people with a graphical tools to deploy applications on ZOS. Again, no JS, right? Server side Java script. The Frisian toolkit, right? Create short-term environments to test with. Rational build agent toolkit added. Support for these three development environments. RDZ is old, rational developer for Z. 
IDZ is the new one or a newer one. The newest one is what's called Z, uh, Z Open Development or Z Open Dev, as a lot of we all call it. So here's my, actually my screen that I use uh, for IDZ. I don't log on to TSO if I want to build or do things. I use IDZ. And I can gain access to all my files, edit JCL. It's got special editors for COBOL, Assembler, Java, C. I can do everything I need to do and never log on to TSO. Submit jobs, look at output. You know, it has a 3270 emulator built in. I can do CSS transactions, old green screen if I want to. Um, I can bring up a, you know, an interface to do RESTful interfaces, the HTTP type request. What modern developers are used to seeing without even logging on to the mainframe, right? And do whatever you want. Still gonna have to learn JCL, unfortunately. Open Dev, this is the new one, open development, okay? Um, not as costly as our IDZ, doesn't have as many features. It does provide COBOL editors, PL1, um, don't know if it does assembler, does JCL editors and that, but again, it's a, you know, a graphical based tool that allows us to, you know, through a clips based tool that allows us to interface to the mainframe, but in a fashion that newer developers are used to using as opposed to TSO ISPF. Rational developer, I would include a disk for grins. A lot of people still use it. Um, again, still works perfectly fine. Doesn't have as many bells and whistles as IDZ, but it does basic COBOL, Java, you know, PL1, et cetera, development, kind of like IDZ does, and basically the same type of interface. So could also be used to build a lot of Java applications, just like IDZ can too, okay? Okay, one more slide, folks, and we're done. ZVM, I wanted to include this um, for modernizing the mainframe, if you will. So basically, ZVM is a virtual machine, right? That's what VM stands for. It's for virtualization. Uh, I can support all the main disto distributions of Linux as guest under ZVM. Like I said, there was a company here that had thousands of them running on a single IBM mainframe. IBM does what's called Linux on Z, or Z Linux, right? Uh, runs on an LPAR. The main, they, they took the standard distributions, you know, Slash, Arhel, Ubuntu, right? And they plug in, you know, they add to it their own persona, really to support the hardware, you know, special hardware interface. Other than that, it's standard Linux kernel. Okay, IBM's put a lot of money into Linux development. Okay, so again, the Linux one, Rock Hopper mainframes, those small business class machines, but can be totally configured to run IFLs and Linux. Don't necessarily have to run ZVM or ZOS. We can run up to 40 LPARs, right? That are pure Linux systems. RHEL, Celeste, take your pick. Again, we have the special CPUs, the IFLs, gonna run native Linux systems on a mainframe. So they have been pouring a lot of effort into making sure the mainframe comes into the world. Um, don't know what else I can tell you in an hour. Uh, I just wanted to give you all the things. I'm working with most all this stuff myself. Yes, as John said, I know Assembler, but I also know Java. Written a lot of assembler code, COBOL code, C code, and Java code. Okay. Now trying to master JavaScript, especially server side with Node.js. So here's my email again. Thank you for putting up with me for this hour and five minutes now, six minutes. Um, if you got questions, if I can answer them for you down the road, please send me emails. I do answer. John, back to you. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. Tom, I gave us some great information today. 
hopefully you found that useful for your stuff. Remember, you can download our slides if you go out to our website at femasync.com, or if you're still in here, you can go to the Downloads tab in the dashboard and download the latest version of that. Tom did make some slight changes there. Um, remember, go out to the website. The recording will be out there in a couple of days. Also, be aware that our next, you can see our webinar schedule out on our website also. So you, not only can you see the past webinars, but upcoming ones as well. We do have one on April 9th that has to do with DB212 uh, for ZOS uh, for function level 504. It's for activation and management. Uh, so be sure to register for that. Otherwise, everybody have a great day. Thanks again for attending.